Welcome to Functional Futures. Our today's guest is uh, Eric Svedang. Not only uh, is he a programming language designer, but also a game designer. He made a well-typed, game dev-oriented Lisp dialect called CARP and put a programming language into one of his amazing games as a mechanic for puzzles and perhaps more. But Eric will uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much. That sounded correct. So it's, uh, was it... Was it uh, Kind of just the puzzle or just as like puzzle mechanic or, or something something more uh, um well yeah it was the main mechanic of the game i thought it was it's such an interesting uh, uh, system for puzzles because you can solve the problems in a lot of ways as all programmers know there isn't just one way to solve a puzzle usually in games if there is a puzzle there is one or two possible ways to do it but with the programming puzzles, uh, you can argue which one is the best, and you can come up with an elegant way or a fast way, and so on. Um, so that that fascinated me as a game designer. That's 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 really cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember in the trailer, right? There is a, a little spoiler of uh, the high score puzzle. Okay, <laughs> the person just over overrides. I, I the high actually score, don't which remember is the shortest. But yeah, uh, you learn a lot of. Uh, the basic uh, stupid things like brute forcing codes and so on yeah yeah, yeah. i mean for for me uh, you know as an it security enthusiast i would i would suggest uh to to play uh this game sorry what, what was the, the the game's name i, I forgot <laughs> uh else heartbreak uh, which is also oh. a kind of hint of how to solve the game oh nice Right, certainly give it give it a try. It's a, it's a cool uh, cool game. Um, so yeah, we, we invite a lot of programming language designers uh, to our podcast, and you know, uh, we normally kind of jump straight into the goals of you know their programming language and some specifics of, of the runtime, perhaps, uh, etc. But with you, obviously, we, we start with games uh, because this is uh, um, as far as I can tell your passion, and I think that in case of uh, CARP, your language. It's kind of impossible not to start uh, from the talking about games. Um, so, um, I mean, I hear a lot of stuff like, "Oh, okay, like games are silly," or, 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 or "Why, why do adult humans play play games?" So, why, why are games so important to you? Oh, big question. Um, well. I think most humans actually do play games. Like even people who say they never play games actually prefer or like to play some games on their phone and they like to play games with their friends and so on. So uh, it seems to me like only very boring, busy people never play games. Uh, and it's just a part of uh, like life, I, I think, to enjoy games, especially with others. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just, uh, for me, it's just one aspect of a full life. Like you have to have food, you have to enjoy music and you have to play some games sometimes. That's a good, a good description. And when you were talking about it, I thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe even some day-to-day -day activities that people don't recognizes games have features of games or people think about those as games without you know without realizing that those are games sure yeah i think that happens a lot like crossword puzzles or game shows on tv and so on like that's a very old-fashioned way of streaming <laughs> that's true yeah well, well we we kind of got into taxonomy already a little bit so but it's it's actually like a very i think important thing to consider when when we're kind of thinking and talking about games kind of what are the buckets into which uh we would distribute um games and and you know in in my humble opinion because i'm not like a professional game designer but i think that um kind of the games that a particular game designer kind of like the way that a particular game designer spreads the games into these buckets uh, 
informs the you know the games that that's, this designer makes so like for you for example would you put like magic the gathering chess and go in, in the same bucket or in different you know where would you put stuff like uh, infocom uh, games uh, you know sims and dungeons and dragons are they go also go in, in the same bucket and um stuff? well that's Seems like a long, wider way to get me to define what a game is, uh, <laughs> which, as an academic of games, uh, that's uh, a whole complete podcast. Um, uh, well, I, when I create games, I don't think too much about these buckets. I, I would say that uh, my my two like my games I have usually fallen into two piles so one is a very hardcore versus games kind of like new versions of chess and go but maybe for uh, ipad and uh, for the digital medium um, so those are very much like hardcore game mechanics games and then on the other hand i've also worked a fair bit with uh, storytelling in games um, and i think those games usually can't use game mechanics in the same way. Uh, it's uh, hard to force too much uh, game mechanics on that kind of game where the story is actually what you want to uh, focus on. So for example, in Els Heartbreak, which is one of these story games, despite the puzzles in the programming, like if you fail to solve the game or the puzzles, you actually still get to experience a story. It's just a story about this programmer who is not very good. And it still becomes a fun story. So I think for storytelling, failure is usually like a big part of it. Like stories are about people who have problems uh, and maybe they succeed in the end, but uh, still like tragedy is a big part of good storytelling. So I think um, that's maybe one of the big... Uh, uh, kind of divides between uh, games. Like, should the game be about winning or about losing, maybe? Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, uh, one way to divide up games. But uh, on the other hand, there is so much technology and systems thinking and so on that overlaps be between these two things. So you could just as well put them into the same bucket and say that it's just games or whatever. Well, yeah, for sure there is uh, certainly intersection and, you know, and then and, and, and this gradient and those things that you talked about that they're for sure like not mutually exclusive because we have like very, you know, examples of very dramatic games with very tight mechanics, like for example, Braid or Cave Story. Sure. Uh, um. And, um, you know, that like, I think people play them for mechanics, right? But there's also this like overlapping, um, yeah, overlapping yeah. story going on. Yeah, a lot of uh, uh, modern good games, uh, of course, try to have a story, but they also have very interesting mechanics. And I mean, that's an art into itself to just kind of make those two things work at the same time. Um, I think they are, like you say, they are mechanically based in the end. Like losing is not really an option there. It losing doesn't affect the final story of the game. Uh, I think in a game that is just about story, uh, the the game shouldn't restart probably if you fail, uh, which it does, uh, or unwinds as in braid. Right. Yeah, that's that, that's a very good criterion. I'm I'm a little bit surprised that that you don't uh, uh, that you aren't like uh, kind of more aggressive with your cat categories. Um, does it mean that does it mean that like for example when you're making like a versus computer game? I mean, obviously there is one there's one game you made that that started as a board game, right? And then it kind of migrated into into a computer game. Uh, which which is very interesting, and I would like you to to talk about it. But like that game aside, for example, uh, would it would it imply that like uh, when you're making, let's say, like a computer versus game or versus like 
so many versus uh, versus a board versus game uh, do, like do you think about them in the same way or there are like kind of meaningful categories beyond just like obvious stuff like oh, okay with computer we can automate a lot of randomness and we don't need to you know care about it um, um, etc et um, I think I used to think about them completely differently or more differently but I also feel like the more I've played board games and thought about this i feel like uh board game and social play and word play and all kinds of play can really or could really inform video games in a lot of ways um i mean let's take something like uh, among us um which uh is kind of a social party game converted to uh, a video game um, and got a really big effect out of that. That's maybe a good example of the kind of thing you can't really get to. Like, it's obviously inspired by uh, board games and so on. So I, th I think the more I learn and think about game design, I, I realized it's all like it's all the same actually in the end it's systems that we interact with and what's really important is like what happens in our head when we play and how we what we experience uh, actually that's that's a very that's a very interesting interesting idea i wouldn't i wouldn't say i uh i had a revelation a revelation as big but but i did have like a, a kind of Revelation in the same ballpark. I noticed that while playing Civilization, uh, a multiplayer game of Civilization, and uh, very intensely doing stuff, I can't tell if if what's on the screen is in strategic mode when when all you see is like tokens, um, very flat like two D stuff, or it's all this beautiful kind of, uh, you know. Uh, scenery with, with with birds flying around and like 3d uh, 3d models and and this is how i realized what what you basically said right that 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 the game is happening in your head right yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 i think that's very uh, that's very interesting and yeah games can really mess with your head i've had visions after playing some games a lot like they really get under your skin and into your head uh, sometimes. No, absolutely. This is, this is really weird. Is there some science about it? Because <laughs> for me, for example, I remember like even as a kid, you know, when I would play some, I don't know, red alert, like I would, I would close my eyes and I would see this, uh, you know, health bars, let's say. Mm. Um, and like imagine, you know, moving, moving yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever, clusters of units. Uh, is, is there some <laughs> science about it? Is that just like a visual imprinting or something? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I'm. I don't know actually. Um, I'm not that up to like the neuroscience of games. Actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> we should we should check on Google Scholar after the podcast. Yeah. Um, well, um, there is. I wonder how many of our viewers and listeners currently think. Well, what is what is game design even? Because. On one hand, it's like a very, very old profession, right? Uh, like we already mentioned chess and, and Go in passing. Um, but it's not like people who were inventing chess, at least I don't think, were like professional game designers, right? It was very a kind of incremental process that spanned like perhaps like hundreds or thousands of years. I mean, we have documented history of chess rules evolving even over the past, what, three centuries or something. Um, but recently, uh, game design, at least it, as far as I know, it's fairly recent. It started to be recognized as like a you know proper profession, um, and uh, even you know with with like research elements to it. So you can you know go to university to study game design. But I think that there is still like this kind of veil of mystery around it. So if you could like a little bit lift it and then. Talk a little bit about what it means to be a game designer. It would be really nice. Sure. I mean, I've mainly worked as an as a game designer on my own uh, or with a very small group of friends. So I, I don't know much about how it is to be a game designer 
at the AAA game studio, actually. Um, it's probably fun, but it's uh, very few people who get to like command thousands of people to make these huge titles. Um, but I mean, um, usually the game designer is the person who has an idea for what would be a fun game. So they are kind of the person with a, with a vision, uh, a bit like a director for a game. And they try to get this vision through the process of drawing art and uh, programming the game, uh, if it's a video game. Um, and yeah, they're usually also very much in charge, of course, of uh, testing the game, especially in the early stages, like uh, play testing with people and see what is fun. And they, of course, play the game themselves a lot and change uh, the rules of the game. So yeah, the person who comes up with the rules and uh, and the theme and so on for the game. I'm not sure if All that right. was concrete enough maybe you wanted something more uh, no it's more i mean it's it, it's 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 very it's very concrete and i would like to i mean again at a re well actually actually you mentioned that that you were doing and you are doing uh, indie stuff um uh when when looking at your website i've noticed that you have a lot of games that look really fun and that clearly are prototyped right like and the prototype quality like from the photos look really good um assuming those aren't 3d renders <laughs> from from like virtual tabletop or something no no, no. um uh so like what does it mean uh, for for you know for you to to look for a publisher for a game of yours like i i'm, I'm a little you know surprised about uh, this um part. Yeah, I mean, so we have to be clear here if we're talking about uh, video games or board games, because I have oh, published, I mean board games. Uh, multiple video games uh, on Steam and iOS and so on, but I've actually never gotten a board game published. Um, uh, it's a mystery to me how, how to do that, uh, except, I mean, Kickstarter is the big thing and has been for a long while, but... Uh, I was I got scared of that after a friend um, kickstarted his game and had uh, troubles uh, with uh, shipping, <laughs> uh, so I, I've I've just been putting that off. But um, yeah, um, what what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, what, what does it take to to publish a a board game? Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I really, I made these really nice looking versions of my own designs because I wanted to own them. I think uh, board games are fun in the way that they they keep working, even if you don't support them. Like, um, I stress out a lot about my digital games going obsolete and not being possible to play. It has already happened with iOS games and so on that don't get updated. Um, I think it's really cool that I could create this really nice looking game and put the rules into the box and then uh, give it to a friend and they leave it there and maybe their grandchildren finds it and they can still play the game. Um, uh, that's very satisfying to me. Like you put something beautiful and nice looking into the world and it just keeps working until it becomes trash or someone throws it away um so yeah that's why i made those uh, prototypes really nice i mean they they could just be really ugly prototypes also but um uh, i i put them on the website because i wanted some publisher to see oh these look nice um and yeah i have a lot of board game prototypes in the works so i i really hope that someday i realize how to sell my game to board game publishers. They are a lot more picky than digital publishers because it's actually a risk to publish a board game. Like they have to decide how many units to produce and they have to think a lot about weight of uh, the stuff you put in there and the size of the box and 
all of that. Um, but with digital games, it's just like uh, nowadays uh, they sell anything because once in a while it becomes a hit, and the the people who own these digital platforms can't really tell. So uh, they just let everything in there, of course. Right. Well, if 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 anyone has a factory or is a is a publisher <laughs> of board games by chance yeah i mean it's not it's not too far-fetched right i mean like a lot of a lot of techies uh normally are also into games and someone can know someone <laughs> sure yeah but yeah for sure i mean like what you said about uh your the prototypes being beautiful absolutely they it, it stood out to me like this is why i i even i was even I wasn't even sure if it's like a very good photorealistic 3D rendering <laughs> or, or it's really like that great uh, looking prototype. Well, I mean, I know a lot of uh, really good uh, artists from uh, like uh, video games. So this one, one of the prototypes, for example, is drawn by uh, the art there is made by Nikolai Trusinski, who is... Uh, just recently released uh, a game about being a card shark. It's called Card Shark, uh, uh, and I'm, yeah. So I mean, I'm fortunate in that way. Like I, I can uh, persuade my friends into making nice art for the prototypes. But um, uh, the the board game publishers are apparently they don't fall for just the pretty pictures. They they have a lot of other concerns too. I assume that print like that publishing a card game is easier, right? Because you can do stuff like MPC or how's it called? Um, what what would that mean? Uh, like uh, there's uh, there's this way to print uh, absolutely custom uh, mm. sets of cards. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and it's very streamlined and it's very cheap. It's very affordable even for individuals, mm. let alone if you have like a bigger you know, print and then the, you know, the, your, your problem, as far as I can tell, uh, is, is basically, okay, how do you, you know, how do you package it? Um, yeah. and I'm, I'm actually, I actually, uh, talk sometimes to the author of, uh, Imposter Kings. I don't know if you have seen this one. No. It's a very, very nice, very deep card game with very little rules. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of plays like, uh, magic the gathering vintage when you have like when nothing costs anything right so so you can just play cards basically and then there's like a very powerful Mm. i counter everything and win card so you kind of have to play around it and kind of um yeah it's 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 really cool uh you should yeah well everyone should check it out uh actually but yeah they 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 publish uh their stuff and it's actually available i think to buy in a shop here in uk for example okay so yeah, so 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 they figured out like at least the, the you know card uh, uh, game uh, bit. So yeah, um, that's probably a good uh, idea uh, to focus on a very small game to begin with. To yeah, yeah. to make a name in that uh, world too. Yeah, and this person is like very friendly, so uh, everyone, anyone actually can. Well, I hope that he won't be mad at me for saying that. But as far as I can tell, anyone can approach him and ask about like game design or publishing or, or Imposter Kings and how he came up with it. And uh, yeah, well, anyway, um, let's let's talk. Let's let's get kind of back to to the to the planned questions. And um, so you already kind of shocked me with your answer about like the categories of games and how you kind of don't do that anymore so uh, i'm i'm i can't be ready for your answer to the game loop question but anyway (laughs) so uh i mean i'm gonna risk because like when i know when i learned about you know what game loop is like it ruined gaming for me (laughs) like just fourth wall crashed and I, i i mean i rebuilt it eventually but it was it was a dramatic episode so if you want to still enjoy games, dear listeners, please close your eyes uh, and ears for the time being. And uh, yeah, at the risk of, 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 of spoiling how the sausage is made, please tell us what Game Loop is and what you think about its importance and you know how you incorporate the concept in your game design. Um, okay, so maybe we should just explain first what a Game Loop is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> what, 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 it is, what it is and how you kind of yeah, use it. Sure, okay, yeah. Um, I think uh, 
I haven't really explained what a game loop is to anyone. Uh, I guess it's the the core mechanic of the game that you do over and over again um, uh, throughout the game. And I mean, in a shooter, it would be like uh, uh, shoot stuff and move around. <laughs> um, do you agree with this definition? <laughs> Um, I guess. I mean, I, I think that actually I, I tried as a, as a, as a, um, you know, as an exercise, I tried to, to write down a game loop for, for chess. It actually is pretty intricate, right? It's not just, you know, uh, pick a piece to move, figure out a place and move it. Right. It's kind of like when your opponent is thinking, you know, kind of see what your opponent, what you think your opponent is about to do. Then when it's your turn, like kind of assess this expectation uh, and figure out what propels your plan the most and kind of find like three or five moves, rank them, pick the best, then check if you blundered and then <laughs> just make make the move. Uh, so, yeah, like, and by the way, uh, uh, it's, it's funny, right? Because um, actually I didn't even think about it, but... Um, the, I, I think that the gap between just make a move that you think is best and like the actual gameplay loop that you should be doing while playing chess can can be you know can cause something uh, many people call like bad habit bad habits in games, right? But I mean that's a whole another topic, right? So basically, a gameplay loop is what you do like well as you said over and over again. And the state of the game kind of propels as as you participate in game loop. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess uh, my if if it's not obvious, I I don't think about that too much. I mean, it's I maybe I think about it when I write down the rules for a game or if I program the game. It's very useful, of course, to find that part that you can just say and then do this over and over again, but. I don't think about it too much when I design. I don't think it ruins. It shouldn't ruin games for you. Like <laughs> it's fun to do the same thing over and over again, or at least hopefully there, that it's a fun thing that you get to do over and over again. So I, I think it's interesting that you put so much uh, psychological things into the game loop uh, because for me those are more like emergent effects of. The loop like in chess the the game loop is as defined in the rules is just uh, make a move and pass the turn um but then you get so much other things like uh, creating these optional moves and uh, hoping that the other player doesn't uh, see that obvious piece that can be taken and so on like there's a lot more going on outside of the game loop than inside it in, in a sense yeah i mean for, for me I, I always kind of you know since i'm a little bit competitive uh when i when i kind of get to learn about the existence of another game instead like okay of course i i need to you know read the rules to understand what's going on right but I like to ask people who are playing this game, you know, about how do they actually play this game, right? And then kind of destructure their kind of answers to to that sort of like real, uh, you know, hidden gameplay loop. Mm. So you mean you don't want to play the game until you've kind of got gathered some data about how to, to play it? or? Uh, I guess, I mean... Yeah, I guess like in in the compet in competitive games, uh, like what what I mentioned, the the bad habits are is, is something that I experienced firsthand while trying to play StarCraft. Like I played StarCraft in a very naive way, and even though I was kind of watching, um, watching competitive play happen and listening to the commentators, it still kind of didn't help me to understand uh you know how, like because like w the dangerous thing right uh, when you look at the grandmasters playing chess or like high uh, uh dan players playing go a dangerous thing is to 
to to start thinking oh they are like superhuman right but no they're actually normal humans and uh it's just that they're they started playing the game when they were like three and uh they had good enough deliberate practice routine to to actually become like top like one percent uh right so and this is what i'm kind of trying to this is the like unhelpful mentality i built for myself with some games saying oh you know korean starcraft players are just superhuman right uh and yeah i'm I'm just not trying to like not uh, be like i don't know disappointed in myself or something like that and and also it's very uh very helpful to to kind of um to see the concessions that you can make in this kind of ideal game loop because perhaps you know that you are not good enough in like i don't know analyzing the the board state but you're good enough in like finding two three move tactical ideas right so like at the table when you're playing a competitive game it it's worth focusing on like your strong you know parts of of the loop and in in practice it's better to you know focus on the other parts so yeah i don't know I, I'm, it's probably a mess of a of, of an ontological mess to, to try to try to put this stuff into the the notion of the game loop, but that's that's how how I see it. Well, I think you should not feel bad about not being the best at games. Like, I, I think the people who have the most fun with games are usually not the people who are the best at the games. Like, usually, I think games are best somewhere in the middle like when you start to unravel the mysteries of the game but uh, it's not all like working on that final percent point of winning um, so yeah just enjoy that you that your parents did not put you into chess uh, school at three. Oh yeah absolutely that's that's certainly something to enjoy it's it, it very rarely does it work out right um and uh, yeah for sure i mean yeah 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 I, I agree completely um but it's also i mean for me it's like it's about not you know being frustrated with like when when i when i lose and i understand why it's a, an amazing experience right because now i know what you know what is what else there is to to learn right uh, or, or refine, but when I lose and I have no idea why I lost, it's it's <clears throat> not fun at all. No, sure. Which is perhaps an interesting thing to to consider for game developers uh, and game designers. Sorry, to to kind of provide a feedback like you lost because yeah, but also people are not rational always. Like. Uh, of, of... A well-known fact is that adding randomness to a game can help make people who lose feel more okay with it because uh, uh, they can just blame randomness. And then when you win, you feel like it was your skill. So, uh, and that kind of is a counterpoint to what you're saying. Like people don't want to know the actual reason; <laughs> they just want to get a warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, so I don't know. That's it, that's it. A... Depends on the person, maybe. That's a very, very, very cool, very cool point. I mean, like, um, yeah, one, one of the big uh, kind of criticisms towards Magic the Gathering is like, oh, it's so random. But then if you, if you, if you look even at standard deck building rules, it's like four copies of a card over sixty cards. Like there are like eight cards in your deck, and you draw seven in the beginning of the game. Is it really that random? I mean, it is obviously random, but like. You know, it's just. It's just uh, yeah, it has a mean, really yeah. great uh, mix of randomness and skill, actually. Like, very much randomness, but it's very obvious also that skillful play helps. So, I've seen a wonderful, uh, wonderful. I, I'm not sure if it was a proper academic paper or it was just a nice little uh, Jupyter notebook uh, where uh, they compared. Um, so, they compared. Uh, NFL, I think, with Magic the Gathering in terms of you take the ELO of an NFL team and an ELO of uh, their opponent and how much do, does ELO predict the outcome of the Ooh. game 
and uh, Magic the Gathering just wrecked NFL. <laughs> so okay, that's interesting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is usually the the same people who show up at uh, tournaments and so on and win. And um, so even though there is all the, this randomness going on, uh, people can still fight through it and come out on the other side winning. For sure. Um, so, all right. So we we and okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of in a way not surprised with your answer about uh, your slight neglect to the gameplay loop. Oh, by the way, I just to, to close the the loop, the, the topic of the game of the gameplay loop. I want to mention one interesting trick. So, one role playing game designer uh, that I know, he said the following: that the best games he makes are ones where there is a very rigid gameplay loop. And over the first like three or four sessions, player learn, player like kind of study, players study this gameplay loop, and then the fifth session just breaks it, like it kind of just subverts the expectation in a major way. Mm-hmm. And then everyone feels like they're already like you know, learned the rules, but then they kind of mm-hmm. invert, and then and then the final session would be like to deal with the you know with the outcome of this like unex- and everyone and people don't even know why they feel so shaken mm. by by this but they do that's very uh, cool and yeah, yeah i mean that's i guess that's what uh was one of the major motivations for me to make uh, the programming game as heartbreak 2 where you you are within the constraints of the game and you learn like how that world works for, for a couple of hours and then all of a sudden you can actually change the code of the game uh, and that uh, that is very uh, an interesting feeling when you when that happens in any culture of course uh, or any kind of like book or movie or game um, because you kind of know you have learned the rules you know enough about this particular universe and then you yeah uh, you go outside of that and that is i guess a definition of something magic like. Oh yeah, and um, another one without spoilers. If you want to experience something like this, you should absolutely check out also uh, Spider and Web, an Infocom game by Andrew Plotkin. Oh, I still get goosebumps. When I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that I've that, actually not, not that played term. that one. I think so. But uh, thank you for the recommendation. Yeah, let's say we we figured out the uh, gameplay loop or like like shoved it aside. So, and you mentioned that game designer works a lot on playtesting, right? So, what are the actual further like stages in game design before you can, you know, present your black and white prototype or beautiful prototype to your friends and then start uh, kind of uh, testing? Well, I mean, the <laughs> the most common place for game ideas to die is when you just try to make it work the first time i would say um and you know someone has a great idea in their head and they think about the game and then when they sit down and start to try to put it to paper or to code or whatever and it just falls apart and it doesn't feel as much fun as it felt when you when you thought about it because when you thought about it in your head it was all like alive in a way but then it gets you have to make it so concrete when you make it uh, on your own um or actually make it um so yeah th- that that's the first play test and it's not even a play test it's it's just like uh, the 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 first obstacle to get over uh but if you can get over that i think and if you can get through like a uh, usually i try to just simulate the game uh, versus myself to spare anyone uh, the pain of having to play through the game. But if it feels like I'm actually having to make interesting decisions on my own, uh, let's say this is a board game, um, then I'll bring it to uh, my girlfriend or a friend or something and start playing it. And usually it changes a lot from there and then you just keep doing that and making 
hopefully smaller and smaller changes until it's something that actually works. And by that point, maybe you have started adding art and so on. And then you're actually kind of uh, recreating that magic that you had in your head from the beginning. But there is a long uh, stretch there where you, where it's just not that cool. <laughs> Uh, but but if there was something with your initial idea, I mean that's kind of the the trick to to have this kind of seed or core vision that you can have as a kind of to remember that feeling that you wanted to create in people at the beginning. If you can use that to get to the endpoint where that actually happens, uh, uh, that's very cool and satisfying and then you probably have something good by that point i'm not sure if those are re more recent um, creations of yours or uh, vice versa but for example you have a game called a series of interesting decisions right uh, and when choices I, when, when, but yeah sure oh sorry uh yeah I, doesn't matter bad with names of games as well apparently <laughs> so um so yeah, so in a series of interesting choices, uh, was there also that kind of seed that you wanted to relate to people or it's kind of more academic kind of thing? And what is the game about? Uh, <laughs> also mentioned that. Uh, I guess I did. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the game is named after this quote uh, from uh, Sid Meier. Um, his, that was his definition of, uh, of what a game is. Um, so it's kind of a homage to that definition, which I think, I mean, it's not the best uh, definition uh, in, but uh, in a way, but like, it's not, not the most clear one, but it's good because it gives some, uh, it actually gives you some idea of what you should try to do when you make a game. Um, it's not just a dry, uh, dead definition. Um, Anyway, so yeah, that game was made um, as part of a course. I, I studied just for fun. I, I took a course in pedagogical game design um, with, usually, like most students there was, um, uh, you know, maybe they were teachers and so on, or teach teacher students. Uh, and they were teaching like biology and so on. So they made uh, games about biology or politics and so on. But uh, since I, at the time, worked as a game design teacher, I thought, okay, so I should make a game about game design. Um, and that's what it is. So it's a kind of game where you uh, get a bunch of um, things, uh, related to games so mechanics and themes and so on and you have to come up with a game in like five or ten minutes and write down the rules for it and then you play these games so you all go through the play testing phase which i think is very good for people especially who have never designed a game to see and they're not allowed to speak either like they can't correct the rules of the game which is very funny uh, and also uh, very annoying um, <laughs> and uh, at the end you have to guess which ones of the cards um, with these mechanics and themes uh, that belong to which person so it's kind of like uh, uh, Dixit and that, that those kinds of games where you have to uh, figure out uh, what what thing belongs to who um, and yeah that's it um, and it's usually, I mean, people find it very hard, of course, to play, but it's not impossible to come up with something in five, ten minutes. Uh, you just have to go with kind of your gut instinct and not make it very complicated. So, yeah, I came up with a really fun little game once when I play tested that game. Uh, I got something with... I don't remember what keywords I got. Maybe something with math or addition or something. So I just made a game where each player ha draws a card from a deck of cards and you all reveal them at the same time. 
and um, uh, then the goal is to say the sum of all the cards on the table and you only get one shot and it becomes uh, super stressful when you try to add up all these numbers and you become really stupid uh, or at least i do when i try to do math quickly uh, and yeah it was just uh, i would never have come up with that game without playing uh, my game <laughs> uh, but yeah so i think it works also as kind of a uh, a creative tool but it's uh, mainly good for you know first year students in game design who have never actually designed games before and they can kind of go through the whole cycle of creating a game in a few hours instead of uh, like having a long course where they like it's it's better to just uh, iterate and do like play this game five times and then you have actually some experience and you will feel more like yeah i know how to design games that's that's, that's a really cool story because i'm not sure if you advertise it on the website as like an educational tool oh <laughs> Maybe I just I can't advertise. Uh, no, no. I mean, in, I mean, it's well. I mean, I'm, I'm a strange person, so for me, it's a, it's fun just as a pastime. It would be fun just as a pastime. By the way, can I order it? Like, is it in print or? Uh, yeah, it's print on demand. So unfortunately, it's a bit pricey for what you get. But you can you can get the rules uh, of the website, and you could basically play with what you have at home also with. For sure, yeah. 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 And the, there's I mean, the it's... deck of cards with the mechanics, uh, and that's pretty affordable. So that, that's my uh, suggestion if you're interested in this game, to just get the deck. Yeah, but I mean, I, I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's 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 a really good way to teach. So I'm, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it hits on the nail. Like, it, it, it does look like an, a, a way to, to teach game design. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's very good. Um, from I mean, from how I imagine it would play. Um, so yeah, if anyone is like uh, interested in in uh, the pipeline, then uh, go ahead and check it out as well. And yeah, by the way, regarding the Sid Meier's quote about the uh, series of interesting choices, um, I'm I will humbly say that I never heard this um, quote before. But when I, for example, criticize Dungeons and Dragons rule set right <laughs> this is something that i appeal to right that i don't want to you know to have to i don't want to play a meta game of i sit at home and figure out the optimal build because because otherwise i'm worse or more useless than my friends especially in third edition it was it was a big problem right i would rather explore my options as i play the game and make like interesting decisions or interesting choices mm -hmm. uh at the table right so um yeah this is this is i think this is a very constructive way to to you know to to look at like at your play testing and look at the diversity of the decisions uh with good players for example yeah yeah uh, whatever good player means for sure so um yeah, I really hope we'll have we'll have time to for for the audience question. I really underestimated the the uh, you know the length and the, the, uh, the diversions that uh, we're going to take uh, during this podcast. But yeah, let's let's try to bring in some some technicalities. So um, let's say you have some game in your mind and you want to uh, you know to to relate to the people to people in the most scalable way and as you mentioned in terms of publishing the most scalable way is uh, digital games computer games um, so um, approaching the language that you made uh, for, for for that is game oriented like can you tell us a little bit about you know how do you approach programming? Does it mean like does it mimic the design stages? You you mentioned that for you know for to have like maybe game loop, it's nice to know the gameplay loop uh, that that would mimic not one to one perhaps, but in a rough in a broad strokes. But you know what 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 else is there 
Like, do you have a method? Like, do you do you know? Like, you you have an idea for a game. You kind of outlined its mm. rules, let's say, and like then, do you know? Uh, like, okay, I'll take I don't know Unity. I'll encode my gameplay loop first. Oh, sure. You know, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah, I. I mean, I've been jumping around a lot when it comes to t technology. Uh, I guess Unity is the thing I've used the most. Uh, a lot of game developers uh, have the same story so it's like the go-to tool uh, creating my own language is of course a way to get away from that like my latest project i i used c for that one um as a way to uh, not have to use unity um but i mean no matter what what you do what when you make video games <clears throat> What you usually want to do is to get something up on the screen and if there is a, a game about uh, moving around something <laughs> which is of, which it often is uh, you want to be able to move that thing with your controls and uh, the interesting thing about that is when you as soon as you have that on the screen since you made this happen you usually get stuck for hours. Uh, anyone who has programmed a game knows this. Like, it could just be a square that you move around with your uh, gamepad, and it's so much fun to move it around. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess uh, the professional part of me is like, yeah, yeah. So then I don't do that for five hours, but uh, maybe I do. Um, but yeah, you just want to get to a point where you can start uh, feeling if there is some kind of magic to your idea uh i mean usually when usually with video games there is a lot more extra stuff uh and reusing of like tried and true game mechanics uh, for example maybe you are creating a platforming game where you jump and even if you have a lot of interesting ideas around that you know that the jump part like it's gonna work if it doesn't work it's because i did a, that did something wrong it's not like this is not this is a broken way to uh, to control a character while uh, if you create uh, your own kind of game system from scratch for a board game it could very well be that it's not working at all um, so it's a bit different in that uh, sense um but yeah, you just want to get uh, to the to the unknowns quickly, I guess. Uh, to uh, see if you can get those working, and if uh, if your programming skills are good enough to to make it happen, whatever it is that you want to happen. So, uh, as far as I understand, in general, like. Uh... Your answers are very artistic, right? I ask you like, oh, you know, uh, how important is gameplay loop to the core of your, you know, of your work? And you're like, well, it exists, right? And I use it <laughs> to a degree. Um, so, so uh, basically, as far as I understand, like, you're 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 um, kind of going through like the boring parts, right? And then you get to this open ended you know, thing where you actually, you know, code your game and then, you know, you hope that you don't crumble under like technical depth, third party dependencies and stuff like this. So where does, where does CARP come into this? So from, from what I heard, like you, you come up and from what I understand from our interview so far, you kind of created it like out of frustration with the state of the art, one could say, is it fair? Uh, sure. I mean, I've spent a lot of time, uh, basically the last, 10 years or so to try to come up with a way to write games using like functional languages basically uh, ever since since i i did a lot of research on programming languages when i was making the language for else heartbreak and that got me of course into a lot of uh, theory and books and uh, information about all these uh, functional languages and they really spoke to me, especially uh, Lisp and Haskell. Um, and uh, at the time, 
Clojure was uh, kind of new-ish, uh, and I learned a lot of Clojure, and that was my favorite language for a while, and I really wanted to make games with it. It felt like the perfect system for creating games, like with the live reload and all of that. Um, but I, I just realized that uh, it had a lot of problems uh, for making a sizable game. I mean, as Heartbreak is uh, not super optimized, but to, to create something of that size in enclosure, it, it would kill the computer. It would die, <laughs> probably. Um, yeah, it just it's just really hard to uh, to handle the kind of data throughput and garbage collector nonsense that you have to deal with in in that kind of language. Um, but at the same time, I like many people. I had seen the light. I had seen what uh, how nice these kinds of languages could be, and I it just felt really boring to go back to write games in C sharp and just be fine with that. Uh, so that's uh, when I started thinking about how to, if I could make a kind of a lisp that I could actually use for my future games. Um, that, that was the vision and goal, uh, which I'm still working towards. Like I have not yet made an actual finished game with Carp. So it's, uh, it's still just uh, a distant goal, but that I'm still working towards. Do you have some demos of squares moving around uh, <laughs> out there already? Sure. I mean, I've, I've made uh, uh, game jam games and so on with it, but uh, uh, I, I realized that to, to create a big game with it, it ha would have to be even more stable and even faster uh, as a compiler. Uh, like I can't spend years working on something and then get stuck because uh, my language is not good enough. <laughs> uh, even though I think r the runtime characteristics of the language are, would be fine for, for most things I want to do. Um, but there is also just the whole tooling and especially compile compilation speed is uh, becomes a big factor when you make a actual big game or big project. Um, so that's where I'm right now with, with the project. Like I'm taking a very good look at how to uh, create a new, new version of Corp that has much better compilation speed. And then the the main features of Carp are, aside from being a Lisp, are uh, that it's borrow checked and uh, and uh, well typed, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so the type system is uh, kind of a ML, very basic standard. Uh, some types, uh, product types. Uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it's using borrow checking, uh, very Rust inspired, but still um, has a kind of different feel from Rust. It's not trying to be as detailed as Rust. It's trying to be a bit slower, but more ergonomic. I think, uh, I mean, Rust is obviously very huge influence for a lot of uh, programming language designers nowadays, and especially people who want to make uh, languages for games and so on. Uh, and yeah, I think it's just um, kind of an interesting, like Rust has made uh, their decisions, but there are many little choices you can make different from them. And I, th I think it's cool to see uh, different languages trying out uh, like variations on the, like the core idea of a, a fine type system. Um, 
So uh, yeah, it feels like Rust really started a kind of revolution there uh, with lots of languages uh, experimenting with those ideas. It's kind of so. It's kind of interesting. So, do I understand correctly? That the biggest problem, for example, with using uh, closure for programming games would be that you have a lot of stuff going on all the time, and you want to. Um, and 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 since it, since, as you mentioned, since it, since it has a garbage collector, you kind of want to make sure that you know you don't like kick up between the frames or something like that but how does how does unity actually solve the solve it do they have like some sort of custom runtime or like .NET is just so much better like <clears throat> sorry for jumping from carp i just thought about it it's it's, it's interesting yeah, yeah. it's it's a very good question and i mean there are many factors there like uh unity is written in c++ i think like the core um so it's actually not c sharp all the way so um that's just in the in user space um so that's one answer the other big answer of course is uh, mutability like it's really relying on mutability so if you just have a thousand objects in the scene and you move them slightly you actually create no garbage at all while if you do that in closure like for each frame you would uh, create garbage for basically the whole world uh, each frame yeah. which is a big difference uh, and um, yeah I guess th those are the, the main uh, differences then also C sharp and .NET is very good for some memory kinds of memory usages uh, but so is JVM of course but uh, uh, yeah, I think all with all those things together, uh, you get a pretty nice system. But people still run into problems with the garbage collector in Unity, so uh, it's it's just become it becomes a problem later in production. Like you can get away with it for a long time, but if you don't think about it, eventually you'll have to start thinking about it, and at that point, it's it's not very fun. So that's also uh, Carp is also more tries to be more upfront about that whole thing. Like you would have to think about memory in the beginning of your project, but not that much in the end. While C sharp is the other way around. That's 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 very interesting. So um do you have so I see, I assume you you actually have a way to let's say like store a mutable state of for the world, right? In carp. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it, it's not super uh, it's actually completely f uh, free in that sense, exactly like Rust. You can um, you can mutate anywhere. It's not like Haskell where you have to mark things at all. Uh, so you, you, if if some algorithm or function is would benefit from some kind of mutability, you can just do that wherever you are. Um, but uh, the main, like, the main tools people should reach for when they write a programming carp are supposed to be functional in nature. So there is maps and filters and so on, and th those are supposed to be how you do the bulk of the work. But uh, you can always go in and mutate uh, if if you want to. Uh, at, at least in the current design. So, so if let's say let's say I want to make like a very very big tic tac toe or or a game of life, whatever, right? Like something that can be unbounded, like that can grow. Uh, so, uh, as far as I understand, in Carp, I would first define this kind of like state of my of the world first, like if I want to, you know, build a unbounded game, right? And then I would, I guess, kind of to do like computations i would write like a library or something with like pure functions and then i would like just copy little bits of the world as i go like as i let's say as i scan it um, and i want to like re-render local uh changes or calculate i don't know uh win condition for a particular x or z or o 
uh, so so like the idea is that I go kind of from this. So I encode the state first, and then I I, I figure out like what are the meaningful checks on the state, I guess, and how they would change bits of the state. And I would write a spure, and then I would call them from my main loop and update the state, mutate the state correspondingly. Does it does it um, work like yeah. this? Or? That's one way to do it. I mean, the way I prefer to do it is to write it very much like you would write it in Clojure. Uh, with immutability, like it looks immutable. Um, so you would maybe have a, a, some kind of reduction over the state or over time as maybe, so yeah. So you're actually not storing the state like in a mutable variable or something. You're just passing it around and around <laughs> in a mutual, or in a in a recursive function, basically, um, from the outside, and um, all your functions look mutable or uh, look immutable. They they take uh, the state and return the state. But since they have the borrow checker rules ingrained in them, they they can do internal mutation if that's faster, uh, uh, and they know that no one else. Is sharing that state, so it's completely safe to do so. Um, so, yeah, uh, it usually that's the kind of code I've been trying to make work. So you you basically take something that would run in Closure, uh, and you run it in Carp instead, and instead of getting killed by TC, it just uh, it never allocates after the first frame, basically. Like right, right. Goal. But 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 the trade-off, like between my idea and your idea, is that your idea kind of implies, uh, like, that you can encode your game kind of, okay, that you can process every tick of the, your game, like kind of from the from top to bottom, right? Like you kind of don't branch out in your processing, because that you would, or you don't recur in your handler. Let's let's put it like this, because mm. then you would like get in trouble with borrow checker, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you have to set it up in a, uh, in certain ways, but uh, maybe I'm uh, misunderstanding some detail that you're talking about. But in, in general, uh, you can you can have uh, different kinds of uh, inputs and so on. It's it's fine. Um, you you just uh, have these functions that look pure and return different states uh, and if and you I mean you you kind of get past uh, stuff like input and so on from the side usually uh, somewhere in the top loop of the application um, so I mean that's a, a very good example of where uh, there is a bit of impurity going on but it's not uh, very it's not a big deal like you know that that's what you want to do and and there is no fuss made about it like it would be in haskell uh, for example yeah yeah and and i guess like as with my example like if you want to to branch out and do some mutual recursion or some weird stuff you can always copy a, a little bit of data right and then do do your thing sure there. sure Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's really cool. And by the way, when you said about like that, when you when I asked you like, okay, how do you develop a game? And you said, well, you want to get something on the screen as soon as possible. With Carp, I can attest that it's like really really quick. It's almost like I remembered in school when we when we had Pascal language and you had like graph module, you could write like use graph and draw straight away. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that that that's. I mean, I guess most people, more most languages could be like that. It, I I just sh ship the compiler with some graphics bindings uh, to SDL. It's not important that it's SDL. It's just like it feels good for this kind of project and this kind of language to have something out of the box. Like it's not the only thing you can use, uh, but it's it's something that everyone will have access to. So if you want to do something quickly or you want to do a tool or something, you know, it's built in and it's there. I, I think that makes a big difference compared to most other languages where you have to 
kind of go to the package manager and find those bindings. Um, I mean, maybe in the in the future we'll have to remove it, but I I, th I think that has been very good for people to just try out the examples and try out the language, like because it's supposed to be used for that kind of stuff. It's it's good to have it built in, and I'm I'm happy you had this experience. That was exactly what I wanted. Like uh, just uh, download the compiler and paste in some uh, simple example code and actually get graphics on the screen and not just uh, text. Is it uh, is your so I mean I understand that your language still has. Does it even have like an, any sort of runtime, or you just kind of like? Um, so what does it compile to, even you know? Like... <laughs> yeah, so right now it compiles to to C. Um, the the compiler is written in Haskell and compiles uh, or emits C code, and then you use some C compiler on your system to compile it. Um, in my new secret version of the compiler, that is going to be much faster. It's using LLVM straight up instead of C. Uh, and if if I get that to work out, it's going to be much, much faster. <laughs> because uh, it has to do a lot of, uh, like, since it's a Lisp, it does a lot of cool stuff with the dynamic runtime to get the language to work. But that is also hard to get fast enough in Haskell, like, uh, at least for me, like, uh, it's hard to write very efficient interpreter. Uh, uh, so the, the idea there is to use LLVM and jitting to get a much faster dynamic uh, runtime. Um, so that compilation is, is faster. That's, that's really cool. Like, it, the amount of the amount of stuff going on, right? It's there's Haskell, then there's a compiler with a runtime, and then there's. Um, do you inject some sort of like scheduler into you into the output, or is it is it like single threaded? Like how how's because yeah, also yeah. it's obviously really tricky to to get the concurrency right if you have like this, you know. Uh, mutable immutability or immutable mutability, whatever. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, that whole part with like what to do with concurrency and threading and so on. I come from game development where that is people are used to much cruder tools, I think, than uh, like uh, web developers and uh, server developers and so on. Like, I'm basically in the camp of like. Yeah, so there's probably some way in your uh, uh, system to get threads, <laughs> and I'm not I'm not super interested in creating some insanely good runtime for green th threads or anything like that. Like that's not really what I want to use. Like if someone want to make that happen, they can probably make it happen. Uh, we have green threads in Carp. Uh, with nice macros on top that make it uh, work as a library. So it's, it's certainly possible uh, to do stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure how much is going to be built into the language. Like I've been looking a bit at Rust and it seems really hard for them to get something that everyone is satisfied with <laughs> and the complexity becomes huge. So yeah, I'm actually mainly bailing on that whole design right now like uh, and i don't think for my use cases it's not going to be super important uh, uh, but yeah there there is no real idea for a runtime like it's supposed to be very uh, very little runtime um, you don't need much runtime when memory is uh, deterministic like yeah uh, all of that is just in in the binary yeah that's 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 very very powerful so i'll uh, i'll wrap up my questions before going to to questions from the audience 
uh, with 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 kind of one last question. Uh, so, um, how do you see CARP used in the ideal world, like in game dev? Like, let's say you have infinite resources and you can like just <laughs> you know hire hire best engineers from Facebook and to work uh, oh, uh, to work on CARP. Uh, um, so how, how would you like develop it and to what goal, right? Like how would people, how would engineers use ideal car? Uh, I see. Um, well, I mean, I, I just want to have a decently fast compiler that handles kind of, kind of what the language is right now. If you download the compiler right now, it, it's a bit buggy, but it, it works kind of, um, and so I, th I, I think that system would suit me very well. Um, uh, so yeah, just uh, no bugs and like decently fast compile times is all I'm really asking for. My, my idea was to make it pretty small and easy to learn language. Uh, so it, it's not supposed to have that much more. It's, uh, it's just supposed, to, I mean, the cool thing when you have macros and so on is that you can create so much yourself if something is missing. And um, that's been really fun to see people, for example, one of the coolest things that the community did with the language was to create uh, like a derive functionality which the language did not have where you could derive different interfaces for types and so on and that was just all built with macros so um yeah it it doesn't need to be much more than what it is right now it just has to be done in a more efficient way and i think uh, now with we have learned a lot uh, from creating this current version of the compiler. So I, I think uh, a rewrite of sorts uh, will be pretty beneficial in that sense, um, since we know so much more about how to create this kind of language. Um, but yeah, um, don't need uh, all Facebook engineers, I think, to to make this happen, it should it shouldn't be like uh, the hugest project ever. I think, uh, and I mean, when it comes to reach out, the, I think there is this very particular kind of person who likes both Lisp and game development. Like, there is definitely a a crew of people who enjoy both of these things, but it's it's not like it's never going to be the mainstream. It's like uh, a niche thing. So, but uh, I think it would be fun if people in that, that niche uh, got to try it out and the, that it worked very well and they could use it for, for their projects. So yeah, uh, just trying to um, fill the needs of, of the game dev Lisp programmer. That's my, my only goal. All right. And before we briefly uh, go through the questions from the audience, uh, Eric, if you want to plug something, tell people to, to where to get your games, uh, you know, the floor, is, the microphone is yours. You can <laughs> say, well, say you. whatever. Thank you. Um, no, um, I'm on parental leave right now. I don't have a that much uh, going on uh, apart from uh, from carp uh, so yeah go check out carp and um, try it out that that's my only wish nice and con co contribute if yeah, you can uh, I to do. the ecosystem <laughs> to the compiler um all right well i'll, I'll just plug our uh podcast please uh, subscribe and uh on on youtube and on your favorite podcast platform uh, if you subscribe to our channel on youtube you can come to the chat and ask the questions like the ones i'm about to ask eric 
So our question number one from the audience is, is there something like REPL driven development for regular game dev? Like, I guess for mainstream game dev, or maybe in Carp you have something like this? Oh, great question. And yeah, I mean, that's, uh, of course, one of the uh, pipe dreams uh, or very tempting things about creating games with Lisp. Um, I mean, Unity has a kind of, uh, they, they kind of make it seem like they have a way to reload scripts at runtime. Um, I've never had it actually working, but uh, uh, you can tell that they had a wish that, yeah, maybe this could work. And that would have been fabulous uh, if that actually worked. But uh, of course, the big problem is what do you do with the state after the reload? And you have to put it back. And if anything has changed, like, what do you do? Uh, so, and usually, something has changed <laughs> after the reload. Um, in CARP right now, uh, we actually have a really sad story for the REPL uh, since we emit C code and have to invoke an external compiler. So you can run code from the REPL, but it's uh, it starts like a new process even. Uh, so this is one of the things that will get a lot better if, uh, if I can uh, get the LLVM version working. In that case, it's going to be an actual Lisp REPL where you can redefine your functions and run them immediately. Um, and I have that working in my prototype and it, it, it's, of course, a lot more fun. But yeah, um, for professional game development, I am not aware of anything. Like people use scripting languages like Lua uh, to get some of that. And that's usually the best thing uh, that you're ever going to get. Like you have some core that takes an hour to compile and then you have some parts that you can just change on the fly and uh, I mean for a lot of games that's a very good trade-off uh, and I, I when I make that kind of game I, I make sure to put as much stuff as possible into config files and so on like uh, that's usually like what you want to change anyways like the position of GUI elements and so on. Like you don't want to spend 10 minutes recompiling just because you want to move a GUI element. But uh, if you change actual gameplay code, you probably have to restart the whole game anyways, because uh, getting the state back in a correct way is, is e an even harder problem than just uh, restarting. Um, but yeah, I, I hope there's some research on this in the future. Like it would be, of course, great if there, but I feel like that's a research project, like how to take some game state and uh, some new code and kind of fill in the gaps to be able to put it back in an intelligent way. So um, there's probably a lot of good things you could do, but uh, I'm not aware of anything that works uh, in reality. In, in, in real time, games where ticks are very oh, frequent, it sounds very difficult. Uh, Infocom uh, ID, uh, well, Inform7 ID, what it does is it kind of, as you interact with your REPL, it captures inputs and then it kind of creates like, since like interactive fiction games are very discrete, right? And the ticks are like, actually not timed they're based well normally not timed based on input so that kind of creates like a graph of all possible inputs and after you change your game perhaps you change some code and some inputs will result in your game crashing but since it's like it's recorded the whole metaverse of of all your you know inputs you can just then kind of navigate and find the non-broken state and kind of keep you know testing from there okay that's very cool Pro probably not too feasible for like real time games, but uh, um, all right. So um, another question is: uh, Let's say I want to make a multiplayer game with Carp. What? How do I approach netcode? 
Oh, you help us write some libraries for it. <laughs> Please. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I well, think there are some bindings for UDP, maybe. So, yeah, that's all you need. Just. Uh, Oh yeah, absolutely. Knock yourself out. I mean, M M Mosh demonstrated right that uh, UDP is all you need to maintain an SSH session. Also, so. <laughs> actually, Mosh is a wonderful project, uh, right? It's it's based on Quake uh, on the idea of Quake protocol of uh, Quake netcode, and then they were like, we can use it for SSH as well. Sure. Um, so yeah, and uh, the final question is, uh, what does Eric like? about lisps specifically is it macros or something else oh i get to talk about lisp i love this um great question um yes yeah, so it's actually the parentheses uh or <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know <laughs> no but i i mean lisp has kind of been stripped of its uniqueness for decades like other languages has taken everything stolen everything uh up to the point where it's hard to motivate in a simple way why you like lisp it's it becomes more of an emotional answer than anything else but but i i think the thing it still has and will always have is the parentheses and i just really like uh, i mean i like the look of them uh, but i especially like the encoding of structure in the syntax in a logical way that uh, the text editor can understand i mean uh, we all long for the day of structural editors when they actually work uh, uh, but with lisps you already have it like it's already there uh, to edit lisp code is such a, a breeze compared to any other language like i feel so much like i'm actually working efficiently with my hands instead of just typing along like uh, and moving uh, like a machine around uh, yeah this is just like you take big blocks of things and throw them around quickly um and i think that's uh something that it's gonna be uh, a kind of a powerful thing of this for a long time like uh, it's hard for others to replicate without actually becoming a Lisp. Um, and I mean, I like macros too, and uh, I've been really impressed with the macros that uh, other Carp people have written. Uh, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a great macro hacker, uh, but to see the things that people can do, it, it's really inspiring. And uh, I mean, of course, a lot of languages has macros, but it's they are always much better looking in Lisp. So, yeah. But but uh, the parentheses and the uh, structural editing is uh, is really what I really like about. Them. Oh yeah, yeah. In in Lisp, uh, the the programs are truly data, and uh, it's a very uh, underappreciated thing. Um, I mean, it's very tempting for me to ask. Uh, about how do you type like do you type check the output of macros oh. like do yeah. you insert kind of do you generate annotations is there like an additional compiler password how does it work um, so the in the haskell uh, the version like the current version of the compiler uh, macros are expanded and then the, the result is type checked uh, so there is there is no type checking on the macro level, uh, so you can write a completely invalid macro um, that actually crashes with something that would uh, be a type error if it was checked, and that's because it's hard to type check. Like you get weird types uh, for for. S expressions. Uh, if you try to encode them in uh, in Haskell, for example, I mean, depends on how you do do it. So, what I what I'm experimenting with now in the rewrite is to actually have them typed. Uh, so that's a big, pretty big change. Uh, that's, um, 
Uh, so yeah, I, I would say it's it's up in the air. Like, uh, if you use the language right now, you macros are not typed themselves, uh, but the final code is always type checked. But uh, there is a possibility that uh, you would actually get uh, type checking for for macros uh, to uh, like at an earlier stage. In the end, those kinds of type errors are not super useful because you would still get a type error when the emit like the expanded code gets checked but of course it's nicer to get it earlier so it's a, it's a, at least a usability feature to have type macros yeah, but it also creates a lot of problems with uh, right like the ergonomics of macros so yeah, that's that's really nice. I mean, it's it's a very very fair uh, approach um, to macros. Well, um, yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it was a huge pleasure to to, to talk to you, and uh, I hope uh, you will have a very productive uh, parental leave, <laughs> and uh, carp will will be faster than ever, <laughs> and uh, maybe someone will get interested in it. Yeah, uh, thank you. It is a really, really nice system. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs>